Hi, and welcome to a new episode of Newsmakers TV, Santa Barbara's most provocative local news program on the air since 2014. I'm Jerry Roberts. It is Friday, October 6, 2023, and I'm honored and very pleased uh, to welcome to the show uh, one of the very best political reporters in the California press corps, Seema Mehta. Seema, a political reporter for the Los Angeles Times, has covered four presidential campaigns, among many other races. A uh, graduate of Syracuse University, she vowed when she arrived in California in 1998, she'd only stay a few years, but fortunately is still among us. Seema, thanks so much. I know you've had a, a totally crazy couple of weeks uh, going on. We've had this uh, political earthquake with the death of Dianne Feinstein and uh, the uh, the appointment of her successor, Afonso Butler, and then Kevin McCarthy, uh, another Californian, gets defenestrated. Uh, and I think a lost in all this was something you covered uh, last weekend, which was the Republican State Convention, uh, where President Trump was on hand. Uh, and I know... Uh, you you reported on his uh, speech, which was even for him, a little long and a little crazy. Talk a little bit about, if you would, about the the sort of aggressiveness and violence of his language in that speech. I mean, I, I've covered President Trump you know, since 2015, 2016, um, but it had been a while since I had seen him live, and it was a reminder of how um, untraditional he is you know, for. Uh, former president or for, you know, somebody who runs at that level. Um, it was, I mean, he, it was, it was really remarkable. I mean, he basically made fun of Nancy Pelosi's husband, you know, who was for, for being attacked. He talked about shooting looters. Um, it was, but you know, the crowd loved it. I mean, they, these people, you know, they paid, what, I think like $600 to see him speak at this luncheon. And um, I mean, there was, and there was hundreds and hundreds of people there. They loved it. Um, they ate it up. And, you know, it's it's hard to see any other presidential candidate get that kind of reaction that he gets from from the base of the Republican Party. Yeah. And there's there's been a sort of a discussion among the among uh, the media this week. Uh, there was a, a piece in The Atlantic, uh, as you know, by this political scientist, Brian Klaus, who says uh, it was uh, talking about the banality of crazy, he says bombarded by a constant stream of deranged authoritarian extremism from a man who might soon return to the presidency. Journalists have lost all sense of scale and perspective, but neither the American press nor the public can afford to be lulled. The man who is president in sight of the violent attack on the Capitol in order to overturn election is again openly fomenting political violence. Do you do you think he's that Trump is sort of going beyond what he's done before in terms of uh, of violence, of, of proposing violence? And do you think the media is being lulled by it? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, if you look throughout his presidency, he did things that were unprecedented. And, you know, whether it was the the ban on people from Muslim countries or, I mean, so many policies, um, you know, are palling around with dictators. So, um I don't know if I don't I don't know if the media as well as the country are sort of lulled by, you know, there's so much chaos with him that you sort of expect chaos. So, but um, but that said, um, it was it was really a remarkable speech. I mean, it, it would turn in, remarkable in terms of just you know he's dropping like the MF word, which it's like if you're gonna do that in private, that's fine. But you hear from a president like you know, um stuff like that. And no, but I mean also like I mean like the Pelosi comment was just really. 82-year-old man beaten with a hammer right. in his own house. So let's make fun. Right. It's just heartless. Yeah. And and you're right. I mean, the, the, I guess one of the most striking things about it was, was the, the, the crowd, you know, chanting Trump, 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 you know. Right. With, with his, and laughing so heartily at the Pelosi husband joke. Yeah. It's really, um, it's it's kind of rough. And then- right. I mean, you know, my, first uh, you know. two, my first two presidential campaigns were largely covering John McCain and Mitt Romney. And while they both had their political differences with um, President Obama or then Senator Obama in 2008, um, it was not this. It, this is so different. Yeah. And, you know, calling for the execution of General Mark Milley. Right. right. Uh, before that, the, as you say, the shooting of the shoplifters. 
Right. Um, yeah, it's all uh, kind of troubling. Of course, we allegedly have a campaign going on for the Republican um, nomination, uh, and there were other candidates there as well. I guess Tim Scott, uh, Ron DeSantis, and uh, Vivek uh, Ramaswamy. Right. That, what kind of reaction did they get? Was anybody uh, listening to them? They didn't have. They, I mean, they had crowds, but they weren't not as large. And I mean. I was at. I ended up traveling with uh, former President Trump to this stop he did at a ice cream ice shop cream store. <laughs> yes, um, so I, I did not see Governor DeSantis or um, or Tim Scott or, and then I had to go somewhere else. I didn't, I didn't see them. Through. I did see all of them Wednesday night at the Republican debate um, at the Reagan Library, and it's interesting when you have all different you know, sort of stripes of the Republican Party on that stage, but. It's. I mean, it's. It's. It's hard to see, and, and the polling backs this up. It doesn't seem like any. You know, no one. No one has consolidated in support of the anti-Trump vote. Yeah, and Trump isn't paying any any price at all for. No, not for at all. Skipping. Yeah, the setting of that debate was interesting, just because, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan has been the icon for the, you know, Republican Party for what almost fifty years. And, you know, one of his touchstones was, you know, national security of the United States is, you know, strength of the military defending. But this um, split, it's not really much of a split anymore about Ukraine. Well, I mean, it, it's, I think you've got people like, you know, Nikki Haley, probably Chris Christie, Mike Pence, who are on the more traditional Reagan-esque sort of side of this on in terms of national security, in terms of supporting uh, countries who want, who are seeking democracy, or you're know, fighting for themselves, um, and then but then you do have this isolationist strain that has emerged in the Republican Party. That is, you know, I mean, I don't know that Ronald Reagan would recognize the Republican Party today. I mean, this is the man he signed uh, basically an abortion bill in while he was governor. I mean, he signed amnesty for people in the country illegally when he was president. Um, he was an, against Briggs, which would have sort of discriminated against um, uh, gay teachers back in the day. Um, so it's. And he was, you know, he was so into he and the Republican Party in general um, was just traditionally so into national defense. We at the library, you have a chunk of the Berlin Wall, you know, on one side, the part that was in West Berlin, you know, there's there's all these paintings and flowers, and the side that was on East Berlin, it's blank, it's dark, and you know, I mean, he, it, so it's hard to imagine him recognizing this this wing of the Republican Party today that um, that is, you know, calling for the U.S. to basically, you know to stop stop you know our actions you know at our shoreline yeah and the fact that all these people are allegedly campaigning for president but really stop short of attacking the guy who's the front runner in the race or you know except for in a case well, DeSantis, DeSantis, I mean, christie was attacking him for a while yeah christie yeah that's but DeSantis, and then DeSantis started attacking him because well, he, I mean, he has to do something because this campaign is you know not living up to people's expectations um and then i Haley has sort of attacked him, but she's been sort of all over the place. Vivek loves him. Um, yeah. It's been, he's like the, I mean, the fact that he's not showing up these at these debates and it doesn't matter. So, I, what are these people doing? Are they positioning themselves for twenty twenty eight or a, a, sl a slot on Fox or a vice president or I mean, what, what what's going on? Here? <laughs> I think I'll keep up. Um, I, mean, I think you know. I, I do think DeSantis like he really wants to be president. Um, and Hale. I mean, they all want to be president, but I think they're hoping to consolidate the you know the anti-Trump vote. Some of them are hoping to consolidate the anti-Trump vote, but if you look at the numbers, it's still it's really challenging. Yeah, and I think you, it was your piece that pointed out that the three kind of Reagan Reaganites, if you will, the, the Pence and Haley and uh, and uh, uh, Christie. Have what one one out of every seven votes in right. the Republican primary combined? Right. I mean, so, so it's, it's it's really hard to see the path. What uh, with the source yesterday from Iowa, who uh, is is a Haley, so who's been really impressed with Nikki Haley in the debates, and you know, she's had some some strong performances, but he he's like, you know, if 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 you're looking for a path, you have to squint really really hard to find one. Yeah. The other thing uh, that I thought was interesting going into that convention was there had been an effort and i believe led by the chair jessica patterson no uh to change the uh to change the platform to uh, do away with its uh, uh clear opposition to same-sex marriage and and soften it on abortion but that went exactly nowhere yeah and i mean that wasn't surprising i mean i was surprised that it got out of 
the so it got out of this draft platform committee um I got earlier this year a couple months ago um and it took like what's a 14 page platform and it sort of shrunk it to four pages and sort of made it very sort of a little wishy-washy on some issues um and but I, I, I was not surprised that I knowing the state party and how conservative they are and especially the base I was not surprised that that did not get approved but the Republican Party nationally, I mean, it's not really about policies anymore. I mean, it's about whatever Trump says, right? right. It's, right. It's, it's atmospherics or... or, right. Bible, right? That's actually, though, I mean, actually, somebody made this really great point, which, you know, obviously, I don't think Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump, I mean, they're, I, I don't think, even think Ronald Reagan would like Donald Trump. I mean, I don't, I don't think that they're similar um, in terms of uh, how what motivates them and what they're interested in. But for both of them, their supporters were so into them, into their personalities, that they overlook when like they totally veer from conservative ideology or anything else such as yeah. reality. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's Go ahead. I hadn't thought about it before. Um, that's right. And the other thing is, you know, I was, you got this situation in New Jersey with uh, Senator Bob Menendez caught with his hand in the cookie jar pretty badly. And there's an, you know, there's some new polling out and he's at now 5% in the democratic primary. You know, so, you know, Democrats sort of say, well, this guy's indicted. I don't want anything to do with him. Every time Trump gets indicted, he gets stronger. Explain right. that to me. Well, I think that goes back to the fact that his supporters um, overlook. I mean, it's, you know, the, a large number of his supporters truly really believe the election was rigged, which is not true. Um, and believe that there is a you know witch hunt by the deep state, um, which also is not true. Um, but it's really... It's kind of astonishing to me how much, you mean, he's been indicted, what, four times criminally? Yeah, 91 civil, counts. Yeah, and there's some civil suits going on and he's up for damages. And it's, it seems clear that his, it, that his supporters don't care. Yeah. Is that because he hates the same people they do? Or is it because he, you know, they have grievance against the people that he, that he hates, the, you know, Democrats, elites, California, People from the Los Angeles Times, whatever, whatever group it is. He does. He does like California sometimes, though. He, he likes to raise money here, and he has a lot of his top supporters, including some many members of his administration and his campaign, are from here. Um, he's raised in the last election between him and his super PAC and other committees. He raised like more than ninety million dollars here, so he doesn't like California quite as much as. Yeah, well, that was an interesting piece. Uh, that was your piece. Uh, I, I was astonished that he'd raised almost a hundred million dollars. Yeah, it's in, it's in, amazing in California. And the other thing is, the party changed the rules. <clears throat> Excuse me, am right. I correct to sort of help him in the primary? Right, and they did it. I mean, California and also uh, several other states across the nation. And basically, this was it's really interesting. So in twenty sixteen, his campaign was just totally. You know, uh, one one person, Ben Ginsburg, who's a longtime GOP uh, lawyer who's been you know following this kind of stuff forever, described it as like you know five guys on a pirate ship. You know, they, they were totally it's like you know, seat of the pants, um, and they weren't working the delegate game at all. I mean, he had he ultimately had enough votes, you know, obviously in 2016 to to win the nomination and then to win the presidency. But since then, like he he and his campaign and his advisors learned from that, so they they started working in these delegate rules in 2020 uh, or before the 2020 election. It didn't work out in 2020, but um. But they started laying the groundwork. So they've changed the rules and or pushed for rules to be changed in um, dozens of states across the country, including many in California, because our primary is taking place in March instead of June. The state party did have to change its rules to sort of to make make sure that they qualified under some RNC rules. It's all very technical and in the weeds. Um, but they could have changed it a couple of different ways. And the way they changed it is a way that if he maintains his polling, he'll get all of California's. 169 delegates, and we have the most delegates of any state in the nation. And it's like roughly 14% of what you need to secure the nomination. So, um, unless something changes in the polling, he will, you know, he will, he'll, he'll get those 169 delegates. So he just has to win. He doesn't have to get a majority. He has to get a majority to get all of them. If he, if no one gets a majority, then they will be awarded um, by the statewide vote. Um, and uh, they'll be. Uh, so, you know, awarded to Abraham by the statewide vote. But he's but right around 50% now. He's, he's more than 50% in California in our polling. And then also, the way they changed before, California had a really interesting system. They changed the rules for 2020, but that was because we had the, the, the Republicans had an incumbent, pre incumbent president. But if we look back at the, the 20 years previous or the 16 years previous, California had a system where they awarded 
um, delegates, Republican delegates by congressional districts, so three per district. And it was interesting and it was never fully tested, but the, the intent when they enacted that was to allow, was to draw candidates to California because a lot of candidates didn't come to California because it's so damn expensive. You know, we have some of the most expensive media markets in the state. We're huge, uh, 39 million people. So the intent when it was enacted was to allow candidates to sort of surgically target, you know, certain districts. And it is one of the things I found the most fascinating is if you, you know, Kevin McCarthy's district is the most Republican district in the state. Well, that, but that district gets three delegates. Maxine Waters district or Nancy Pelosi's district. There's like five Democrats live there. That, those districts each get three districts and three delegates. So it would, it would have allowed candidates to, you know, target whatever areas they feel is best for them. And, and, but now, but because it's, it's, it's going to be awarded on a statewide vote and because of the cost of advertising in the state, I mean, it, it really seems to discourage um, other candidates' ability to compete here. And I mean, you know, the DeSantis campaign had people on the ground here. I mean, I know one who is literally moving to Iowa this week because they're pulling out of California and some other states that changed their rules in a way they felt like unfairly benefits the former he's president. Putting, he's putting everything into Iowa, DeSantis. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's his, it's a super PAC, to be fair. It's not his campaign. Oh, okay. Um, but, you know, all this said, I mean, come November of 2024, there's no way that Trump is going to win California. I think we can probably uh, uh, agree would, on that. Really is, there, is there down ballot impacts of him be, being the... I, mean, I think the question is like, what happens in the congressional races? I mean, we have, like, we have several really, really tight races that could help determine control of Congress. And the question is, you know, two people... I mean, like, I mean, if you look at Orange County, the last two presidential cycles, this is a you know a county that has not voted for a Democrat for president since I think since the Great Depression, and it voted for a Democrat the last two cycles. Does that impact? Does that have spillover impact on the congressional races, or do people stay home? <clears throat> um, excuse me. I mean, as much as you know, there's a large number of Republicans who support Trump. There's there's a significant chunk of Republicans who do not, and so do they split their ticket? Do they stay home? Does it motivate Democrats more to have him on the ticket compared to somebody else? I mean, so I don't, we don't know the impacts yet, but I mean, he's clearly a unique and polarizing figure in our history. Yeah, that's, a, that's a safe statement. So, um, yeah, and actually the Democrats could take the House just by winning those, what, five or six contested seats in, in California. Yeah, I mean, so there's yeah, I mean, there's so many there's so many interesting house races here. It's really fascinating, and part of it's because of our size. You know, I mean, even though we we lost the seat, we still have 52 districts, and you know, in Orange County, you have uh, the what was the Katie Porter seat, which is an open seat, which is going to be very tight. Um, you have two seats with uh, Mike Garcia and David Valdeo, which, based on the numbers, Democrats should have won, but they have failed to win over and over and over again. Um, you know, Michelle Steele's I mean, that seat's going to be contested. I mean, there's there's a number of of really interesting house races. And the Dems have to defend Katie Porter's seat, who is running right. for Senate, which is a race I know you're focusing on. What's right. the state of play in the Senate race today for for uh, Senator Feinstein's, uh, the late Senator Feinstein's? I still have to remind myself to say right. that her, her seat. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's up in the air. I mean, obviously, Adam Schiff and Katie Porter have the advantage of, in all of the polling. Um, there's a couple of question marks. One, does now that Governor Newsom appointed LaFonza Butler, does she jump in the race? And she's basically said, like, you know, I mean, and, and to be fair, I mean, she was just appointed and the senator's funeral was yesterday. And, um, you know, she has to deal with the transition and like a grieving staff. So, but she has to make a decision soon because also if she's going to do it, she has to raise a lot of money. Um, that would be, that would totally shake up the race. The, on the Republican side right now, you just have like a couple of unknown candidates. This question Eric is, Early. Eric yeah, the question is, does Steve Garvey, the former Dodger, does he enter the race? What, 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 what Have you heard anything about Schwarzenegger? Uh, uh, no, not doing it. absolutely not. Not going to happen? Nope. No. So, all right, so let's talk about that. So Schiff, Katie Porter, and Barbara Lee, three uh, incumbent Democrats, <laughs> and, you know, not a lot of space between them on issues, but uh, Schiff obviously has national name ID from leading the impeachment against Trump. And, you know, Trump hates him and always talks about right. the size of his neck or something. I don't know. Right. Actually, I mean, I mean, with the with the impeachment, with the censure, with all the time, I mean, like, Schiff should be like paying these people because these are like 
you know, just they're basically donations to his campaign because of how much they've raised his, uh, you know, his name ID and his, you know, persona among Democrats across the country. And and it was interesting that just I guess the day after, or really a few hours after Newsom announced his appointment, Schiff came out with early with his fundraising numbers to sort of. Uh, well, he has been. I mean, he and Porter have always been prodigious fundraisers, but his numbers in this in the Senate race have been remarkable. Yeah. And uh, and he's got the endorsement of Nancy Pelosi. Is that still worth anything, even though she's not the speaker? I think so. I mean, I think I mean among I mean, for the average person, I don't necessarily think so. But for power brokers in the Democratic Party, for donors, I think that makes a difference. And her don't I mean she's obviously she's been a prodigious fundraiser for decades. Um, so I do think for donors in the donor network, that is really important. Yeah. Probably if you did uh, parse the policy difference, Katie Porter is substantially to the left of Schiff, I, I would imagine. On, on Schiff, when he was first elected, I mean, and also his district was was you know more purple when he was first elected. Um, now it's totally blue. Um, I think he was more centrist when he was first elected in the '90s. That said, I, I mean, I think if you look at their voting record in recent years, I think it's it's probably ninety point nine percent the same. And how about Barbara Lee? There was a lot of drama surrounding that because our 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 notice our, our governor who never stops talking uh decided to say he was going to appoint a black woman and then he was going to appoint a caretaker and he managed to to piss off barbara lee and her support right. six ways from sunday right. um, what what's what's she's not raising much money no she really is not raising as much money I mean, she's raising some and she has her supporters and people really look back to her vote um, in the early 2000s against the um, use of military force. Um, that she was the sole vote against that. And, you know, I think uh, a number of people of both parties have come around to sort of supporting her views there. But it's hard to see. I mean, it's it's, it's hard to see a path. I mean, yeah. just, the, the, the financial disparity alone makes it hard to see a path, just because it's so expensive to advertise in the state. And then the other thing I wonder about, she's what, 77, 78 years old? And, and you know, we've heard... I had all this commentary about the gerontocracy of the Democratic race. Witness the ninety-year-old Senator Feinstein. Or Senator Feinstein passed. I mean, like the the months were just the previous months were just dominated with questions about her health and you know whether she should. I mean, she had announced she wasn't seeking re-election, but whether she should retire or step down. And yeah, I mean, and we're seeing that with President Biden's campaign too, um, with people questioning his age, um, you know, fairly or unfairly. So. I do wonder, I don't know, but I do wonder if age becomes a factor in the race. Yeah. Well, it seems I mean, like that's that's again, I mean, if she's 77, if she wins a term or two. Like, do Democrats want to do this again, you know, right. in a couple of years? Right. And then try to force her out in the right. same same way they did. Right. Um, so the other thing about our governor, he's got this upcoming debate, I guess, against uh, Ron DeSantis, the governor. Of, what is that all about? What, do, what What's going on there? I think both of them like to hear themselves talk. <laughs> it's as simple as that. But what is Newsom doing? Because he's really... I mean, he's he's out there. While well, he's not running for president right now, um, it's hard to see. You know, the first ad he aired in his uh, re-election campaign last year was not in California. It was in Florida. Um, he's clearly raising his national profile. It's difficult to see that he's not positioning himself for something down the line. Other yeah. than but he would have to get past the vice president. I'm sorry? He would have to get past the vice president, his yeah. old colleague from San Francisco, but he doesn't. And they don't they both have the same consultants still? They do. And that will get very messy. If yeah. that uh, in four years. Um, and to say this, I mean, he, yes, he'll get attention from this. I mean, I don't think anybody thinks this debate is going to change anybody's, you know, hearts or minds, right? About anything. Yeah. It'll just be some, you know, it'll you know, be some pop, I need some popcorn. It'll be fun to watch on TV. But for DeSantis, I mean, he's really in a really precarious place with this campaign. And so is this the best use of his time? I don't know. Yeah. Well, he may not have too much to do on his campaign much longer because it's on a very, it's not on a very good uh, trajectory, but it, w w the thing that interests me, they're going to go on Sean Hannity's show, which Newsom actually did pretty well on Hannity a couple, yeah. what, a month or so ago. He was on Hannity after the debate and he was on Hannity previously when he, was, when he did an extended interview with him. And he, I mean, 
I, I've talked to Republicans who don't agree with Newsom at all on anything, but they sort of admired his um uh, his appearances there because of the his mastery of the facts or his statistics. Like he was able to, you know, push back, you know, when Hannity said things that were not entirely accurate about California, for example, or about gas prices, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think he did an effective job of sort of countering this? view of uh, California as a dystopian hellhole that we both know so well? Um, I think the, uh, unfortunately, for either side, I think that, you know, it, that it's baked, you know, that it's hard, it's hard to see anybody changing anybody's mind. Um, whether it's about President Trump, whether it's about the state of California, whether it's about crime or looting. Um, sorry, my Alexa just went off. I don't know why. That's okay. That's all right. Your cat photo bombed you too. So that's what was that? One of your cats. Excuse me. One of your. Um, one of your sure. I hate to say this, but it's like it's hard to see on either side. You know, people really changing their minds based on you know facts. Like people believe what they believe, and it's just it's we've become so polarized and we've become so set in our ways. I mean, it's it's like they you know, going back to the debate between um, Newsom and uh, DeSantis, it's like. It might be fun to watch, but is it going to change anything? Yeah, all right. It's not going to have any any uh, effect. Hey, you mentioned Biden's age. Let me ask you a question. Um, uh, do you think, I mean, ordinarily the vice president is not an important issue in people making up their minds. And and ultimately, what are we talking about? 75,000 votes in about five different states that, I mean, the Electoral College is going to be decided in with, Wisconsin and and Michigan, Pennsylvania, maybe Arizona and Georgia. Um, so you know, for those twelve people uh, who who are you know in sort of undecided or independent or whatever you want to call them, I mean, it seems like Nikki Haley has articulated this most of all, but that the Rep Republicans are going to run right at uh, Kamala Harris. You know, look, Joe Biden's not either he's you know senile now or he's going to be dead in a week or whatever it is. But you're going to end up with President Harris. And speaking of, you know, somebody whose opinions are about whom are baked in, it seems to me Harris is still kind of a drag on that ticket. No, you know, in the polling, she doesn't do great. You know, to be fair, she's been handed some of these sort of most um, difficult issues, um, whether it's, you know, Central America, the three countries down there and dealing with the migrant crisis or um, just I mean, the, the issue that, that she has been assigned is challenging and it's not something you can solve overnight. Um, and also vice presidents in general, and this isn't just her, like they, you know, vice presidents of both parties sort of get a bum rap. Um, so, cause you have to do, you know, what your boss says and even when it doesn't look great for you. Um, so it's challenging, but I do think, you know, for her in particular, I mean, her presidential campaign um, really did not go well. And then, she has not really been very popular um, among voters since. Yeah, you know. and I got to tell you, Seema, there was a lot of surprise among old uh, San Franciscans yesterday to see her talking at Feinstein's funeral and not Willie Brown, uh, who got, a, got blackballed. And of course, my theory on that is she didn't want all the stories to re re recount their relationship once again uh, if, if they were both on the program. But uh, anyway. All right, Seema Mehta, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, and I know it's been a huge, uh, uh, hugely uh, busy couple of weeks for you. And, and I really appreciate you. And uh, good luck with the Senate race and good luck with everything else. And hopefully we'll get to talk to you sometime uh, while the primary is going on. I hope so. It's great to hear from you. Thanks, Seema. Thank you.